going to talk today about what you should know about the Islamic Ramadan. The Islamic Ramadan. It is a fast that is going on right now and it takes um, almost, uh, it, it lasts about 30 days. And I say to you, if you look at the uh, definition of the of Ramadan, it says it's the ninth month of uh, the Islamic year during which they are to observe strict fasting and they are supposed to uh, observe it from sunrise to sundown. And I am here to tell you today that Ramadan is one of the uh, steps that uh, the Muslims uh, take in their quest for salvation. So during the, the month of Ramadan, they are to refrain from food and drink and sexual activities and all forms of immorality, including impure thoughts and uh, actions and unkind thoughts from sunrise to sundown. And um, followed by that is that every day, uh, which is really the first step, every day they are to pray five times a day and they are to ob uh, observe Ramadan. And then on the last day of Ramadan, they celebrate a feast of fast breaking. In, in other words, it's a feast in which they break the fast at the end of Ramadan. They break it every evening because they fast from sunrise to sundown. So they eat in early in the morning and uh, then eat again around between 5 and 6 p.m. every day for 30 days. And at the end of it all, they, they do what they call the general uh, breaking of fast, which they call Iyad Atal, uh, Iyad, Iyad al -Fatah. You know, and uh, then after this step, they are supposed to go to, uh, they are required to take a pilgrimage to Mecca. So once in your lifetime, you're required to take a pilgrimage to Mecca as part of the uh, walking towards your salvation. And then after you've gone to Mecca and every year at the end of it all, they celebrate another uh, fast of uh, a feast, what they call Festival of Sacrifice. This one is Iada, uh, Iada Ada. So they fast, they go, they pray for uh, five times a day, they, they fast 30 days a year, they, uh, they go to Mecca and then they celebrate uh, uh, this uh, sacrifice uh, festival. And this sacrifice festival that they do at the end of it all, is uh, adopted from Abraham's uh, attempt to sacrifice Isaac as recorded in Genesis chapter 22 verses uh, 12 to 13. And I remember, because I've left uh, Islam a long time when I was about 12 or so, so I remember when I was younger and they were distributing the, uh, the pamphlets to all the Islamic uh, children and I, they, I got one and I remember reading about this, uh, the story of uh, uh, Ishmael being sacrificed by Abraham because it was the, the day of the festival of uh, sacrifice in my father's uh, household in those days, my grandfather's house, they used to kill a cow because the family was large, a ram was not uh, big enough to go, around, to go around. So pretty much by the time if you grew up in the house, by the time you were 11, you could butcher any animal, take off the skin, and you know how to kill the, uh, the sacrifice, you know, so because it was an annual thing. And uh, this, I say to you again, that they adopted from Abraham's attempt to sacrifice Isaac, you know, because after uh, Ishmael was sent away from Abraham, uh, by Sarah, Sarah's request and Abraham was told by God to do it he sent uh, Ishmael and his mother away so that Isaac can be uh, his heir so as soon as uh, this happened God spoke to Abraham a few years later and said to him as recorded in Genesis chapter 22 verses 1 I mean verses 2 to 13 it says that it came to pass after these things, after the incident of uh, 
what happened uh, with uh, Ishmael, that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. See that God mentioned Isaac by name, specifically. Thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. And get thee unto the mount, the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering. Upon one of the mountains which I, shall, I will tell thee of. And Abraham obeyed God, took Isaac, and went, and God showed him Mount Moriah, and he tied up his, uh, Isaac on top of the, uh, the wood. And, uh, when, but when he raised his hand to slay Isaac, God spoke to him again, as we will read in verse 12. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, meaning Isaac, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God. So if you read the beginning of the, of the verse, he says, God did tempt Abraham. Remember when the Lord Jesus uh, taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer? One of the things that he said for us to do is, lead us not into temptation. Because if there's something to be tempted to see what is in your heart, God will lead you into temptation. The Lord Jesus was driven by the Holy Ghost into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So, there are times when if your life is not right before God, He let things happen so that He can see what is in your heart. In this case, He wanted to see how obedient will Abraham be unto Him. So, He said, Now I know that thou fearest, thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. You see how God said thine only son? Because at this time, Ishmael was no longer in the picture. He said, that, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the ticket by his horn. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son uh, Isaac. So, this uh, sacrificing a ram during the, uh, as the last rite of the Islamic calendar of righteousness every year. Is really an adaptation of what Abraham and God, the transaction that they had, because it's uh, in the garden, God sacrificed his own son. He gave his only begotten son. So when he was looking for somebody to bring his, his own son onto earth, he needed to see how dear will Abraham's son be to Abraham because I'm going to give you my only begotten son. Are you willing to give me your son also? Even though God knew he wasn't going to allow Abraham to go through with it. But he needed to see, will Abraham be obedient? And the Bible said that Abraham obeyed God and God counted it to him as righteousness. So now, when uh, it comes to the Islamic Ramadan, you have to understand that uh, one thing. Always remember, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled this transaction between Abraham and uh, God 560 years. I repeat it again. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled this tra the transaction that took place between Abraham and God in the exchange of their beloved sons. 560 years before Muhammad was born. Meaning that Muhammad was not born until 560 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The lamb that God gave on Calvary. You know, so, and then Muhammad didn't start uh, Islam until he was in his 30s or early 40s. So when you add that to 560 years, you're looking about approximately about 590 years before Muhammad, before Islam was founded, Jesus had died, lived, died, and rose again, and ascended into heaven, established Christianity 590 years before Islam came on the scene. So now, what is going on is that when uh, I know this first time because when I was uh, practicing Islam with uh, my uh, 
uh, my grandfather at the time, as I was uh, saying before, when I saw that Islamic pamphlet about the sacrifice of Isaac, and I remember running to, to my grandfather saying, oh, they have stolen our story, they have stolen our story. And he, he looked at it because it was the story, it, it actually was, a, it had a picture of uh, depicting Abraham trying to slay Ishmael. And so, because I was young and I didn't know history, I believed what I was seeing on that piece of paper that Abraham tried to sacrifice Ishmael. But when you know, like I, as I just told you, that Muhammad was not even born until 560 years after the Lord Jesus lived, died, and rose again, established Christianity, and went back to heaven. So it is a false uh, belief in Islam that uh, Abraham tried to sacrifice Ishmael because he was first born. But when you read in scriptures, again, scriptures that were thousands of years, even before the Lord Jesus Christ was born, thousands of years before Muhammad came on the scene, God himself said the following in Genesis chapter 21 verse 12. Let's read it. He said, And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the light, meaning Ishmael that was cast out, because of thy born, uh, and because of thy born woman, meaning Ishmael's uh, mother, Hagar. He said, In all that Sarah said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. He didn't say in Ishmael, he said in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And when you read the word of God, it says, and thy seed is Christ. This was, again, almost 590 years after the fulfillment of this prophecy that God gave Abraham, and then before Islam, I mean Islam came on the scene. So, and I say that, that now you cannot rewrite history. You cannot make things up to form a religion, to get people to believe you and to follow you. Because what, you, what we have is in this festival of sacrifice is an attempt for the atonement of sin. And we are told... Because I tell you, during this festival, I, I used to take part of it. You kill a ram. If you're rich, you kill a cow. You know, or if your family is big, you, you kill a cow. Because one of the things that you do is that you, you send piece, uh, little pieces to each member of your family as a remembrance. So that's why you, 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 the, the bigger your family is, the bigger uh, animal you need to kill. So, but we read when it comes to the atonement of sin. I'm not saying this to knock Ramadan or to knock Islam or to knock uh, anyone, but I'm saying this for you to know one thing. You cannot rewrite history and you cannot change God's righteousness requirement for getting into his heaven. So you can fast, you can do all you want, you can make up your own rules as you go, but God knows what he said. God has his standard. And God will hold every single person to it. So we read in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 4 to 7. That the blood of bulls and goats, ram and cows cannot take away human sin. Let me read it to you. He said, he said, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Wherefore he, meaning Christ, when he cometh into the world, say it. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. Meaning God does not take pleasure in the blood and sacrifices of animals. He said, but a body hast thou prepared me. See, God prepared a human body and he sent his word into that human body in the, uh, in the, uh, in, in the Virgin Mary. You know, and so that word that went into, that she heard, went into her egg and fertilized it. And it became a body and the word of God tabernacled in that human body. So the Lord is saying how he was going to come into the world. So he said, a body has thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, that has no pleasure. God does not have pleasure in them. Then said I, meaning the Lord Jesus talking, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. 
See, there was a Torah that foretold what the Messiah was coming to do, i.e., the Psalm 22 said he will be pierced, he will be wounded in uh, Psalm uh, in uh, Isaiah 53. He will be wounded for our transgressions. He will be bruised for our iniquity. His soul will be made an offering for sin. Even though he has no sin of, him, uh, of his own, God will make his soul, his soul rather, an offering for human sin. Why did God do, go into all this? First, let me finish this. He said, for, offer, for burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, that has no pleasure. They said, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. To do thy will, O God. So uh, Christ said this before he came into the world. So my question is, why did God go into all this uh, uh, not taking pleasure in sacrifices of bulls and goats and that people all over the world are, are engaging in right now? He said, because the blood of bulls and goats cannot wash away human sin. Only God's own blood. It's, sin is a very, like I said before, it's a, it's, a, it's a seed of corruption that sets in just like an apple that begins to rot within. There is nothing you can do to save that apple. It will rot to the core. Even the human body, once sin gets into it, it will rot, it will die, it will decay. Even those that will be raptured, God changes the human bodies. Those who are in the grave will get a new body. The only people that have this corrupting, rotting, decaying body are those people who did not allow God to wash them in his own blood. Because only the blood of God himself can take away human sin. That's how serious the problem of sin is from humanity. So if you turn your back on the atonement of the works of Christ on the cross, you are asking God to let you be responsible for your own sins, for paying for your sins. So, uh, I, I say to you again that Ramadan is just one of the steps of trying to attain salvation by uh, Islam. But unfortunately, it, it, it's uh, sidestepping God's own requirement for coming into his kingdom, for taking away sin. Because we are told... Uh, that uh, in Acts chapter 4 verse 12 that there is no any other name given among humanity whereby we must be saved. I'm going to read it to you. It says, uh, neither is there salvation in any other, any other, any other way, any other religion, any other person, any other uh, uh, entity, you name it. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved this is the thing that you cannot change you cannot have a, a religion that started 560 years uh, uh, 60 years or 90 years after the the uh, atonement work was done thousands of years uh, uh, after god himself set out his requirement for taking care of sin you cannot come in and change it and think that you will make it to God's heaven. It doesn't work that way. You cannot make up a new religion and come up with your own uh, ways of getting into God's heaven. And you cannot rewrite history. You cannot rewrite Christianity. You cannot rewrite history. You can kick against it all you want. You can kick against uh, the preachings of the Bible or the teachings of the Bible and Jesus Christ himself as the son of God all you want but the, the, the fact remains God has a requirement for entering into his heaven and if you don't play by his rule you will not be able to get in and another thing is that uh, uh, when it comes to uh, our stay here on earth God is not going to ask any one of us were you a Christian, a Muslim, a Catholic, uh, uh, you name it, Hindu, Buddhist? No. The question, once you take your last breath and you find yourself on the other side, one thing, one thing and one thing alone, Jesus Christ. I mean, it's like, when he said the rock of offense, 
the, the rock that nobody can move, the rock that the builders rejected. I mean, when you take your last breath, everything now is about Jesus Christ. What did you do with him? Did you let him wash away your sin? Or did you reject him? If you rejected him, all your sins will start playing out before you. So that you cannot even say that God was unfair to you. All your sins will play out before you. And if you, if you belong to the Lord Jesus, all of a sudden his blood will come and just run through the pages of your sins. And they are all gone. But if you did not, and if you are depending on the blood of rams and bulls and goats, you'll be in trouble on that day. So now, always remember that Islam was not started until 560 years old, I mean years after the Lord Jesus uh, lived, died and uh, uh, rose again and established uh, Christianity. And thousands of years after God himself established the procedure of how his son was going to come into the earth and pay the sin for humanity. Therefore, I say all this to say to you, if you are a Christian right now, because one of the saddest things that I read is that someone who, who professed to be a Christian all of a sudden abandons Christianity to go into another religion or to marry somebody because they happen to be billionaire or millionaire or whatever or a king of another religion and then they abandon Christianity. They abandon Christ. And I say to you, for instance, if there's a Muslim trying to woo you into Islam right now, one thing you need to know or ask yourself, ask yourself, what is at stake if I change my religion? To any, if, you, if I leave the, uh, uh, Christianity to Islam, to Buddhism or Hinduism or whatever, what will I lose? Because only Christianity guarantees the salvation of your soul. Because Jesus Christ paid with his own blood for your sins to be forgiven. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can guarantee you heaven. Even in Islam, if you read the Quran, you cannot be good enough to go straight to heaven. When we were little, if somebody dies, we are told you can only cry 30 minutes after they die. Because after that, your tears will become fire, burning the person in hell. Because everyone goes to hell, according to Islam, to pay for their sins. They first go to hell and they pay until they have finished paying for their sins. Then they, uh, they can go to heaven. That's the belief. So the blood of uh, the Ramadan, I mean, uh, uh, the fasting, the, the blood of the uh, sacrifice, uh, festival of sacrifice, you know, they do not guarantee you uh, a straight shot into heaven. Islam tells you you must first go to hell. So in those days, when uh, somebody dies, we're not allowed to cry. After 30 minutes, they said your, your, your tears become fire, uh, uh, like water that finds the flame. <laughs> I mean, like kerosene or gasoline that fans the flame so that the person's uh, torments actually get uh, uh, intense with each tear that, you, uh, that drops on them. So you're never good enough to make heaven. You first of all have to go to hell. And I say to you, if you find yourself in hell, if you let anybody lie to you and you find yourself in hell, there is no exit in hell. When Jesus Christ rose again, one of the things that he said, he said, all hell. All power is given to me in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. He said, I have the keys of hell and death. And he said to us, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. The first time I met the Lord Jesus Christ after my, uh, well, I, I used to see him uh, because he had raised me from the dead. And the one time he came in, and he said to me, you, you have a very studious spirit. So your spirit counted the Old Testament references to my father and the New Testament references to, my father, uh, to me. He said that when your spirit went and saw that more references were made to me in the New Testament than in the Old Testament, the, so my father was, uh, had less references made to him in the, in the New Testament. And he looked at me, 
It was the first time the Lord Jesus as my friend because I, I used to see him as my friend with life since he raised me from the dead even though I didn't actually get an understanding of what everything that he did for me. But this time he walked in, into my bedroom and he was very serious. And then after he told me how I have counted and he said, your soul is in heaven demanding an audience with my father. I'm like, what? The Lord Jesus walked into my bedroom. He said, your soul is in heaven demanding an audience with my father because he wants to protect my father from me. Because your soul thinks that more references were made to me. Therefore, your soul thinks I'm going to cause another insurrection like the one that Lucifer cursed. So your soul wants to protect my father from me. That's what the Lord Jesus said to me. Then he looked at me squarely in the face. He said, but I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to, the, to my father but by me. And he raised his finger and he left in, uh, in anger. And I was so, ooh. At this time, I wasn't in church. I was just occasional religious uh, Roman Catholic uh, pra practitioner. And I was like, I'm in trouble because of all the people that my soul could go try to pick a fight with, not the Lord Jesus. I knew better that it's a fight I cannot win. So I wanted to find out how do I tell my soul, one, stop making count, two, stop making references, and get out of trying to uh, make demands in, in, uh, in heaven, and don't pick a fight with the Lord Jesus. But one of the things that I came away clearly with is that the Lord Jesus Christ is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. You cannot get into heaven without the Lord Jesus. And then he showed me when I got born again, to get into heaven, you see the Lord Jesus is standing. And everybody is going into him like light from all parts of the world, just getting into him. And I remember looking at him amazed because his size doesn't grow. He's just the same, even though billions of people are getting into him as light, but his size doesn't increase. And then when he gets up from that place, and you see him take the pristine talib over his head, and when he steps into the Holy of Holies, he opens up. That's why all of us who are in him can see God. All of us that are in him can have transaction and conversation with God. If you got taken to heaven and you saw God and you talked to Jesus and you went into Holy of Holies, it's because you are in Christ. You could not have gotten there if you are not in Christ, you know? So there is no getting around, you know, to bypass the Lord Jesus Christ to get to God. It doesn't exist. There's no way. He is the way to God. He is the life of God, you know? So if anybody is trying to seduce you away to abandon your faith in Christ, know that what they are asking you is to abandon your soul, the salvation of your soul. Because to abandon Jesus Christ means choosing hell. And I do believe that anybody that have gotten a revelation of the salvation of their soul, the importance of the salvation of their soul, will never, for all the money in the world, for all the titles, for all the fame, they will never abandon the Lord Jesus Christ for another religion or to follow somebody from another religion or to, uh, to gain a title from someone uh, from another religion. You've heard of uh, uh, people that were once Christians, they went because they can become queen of some uh, nations or they can become uh, some uh, uh, wife to a billionaire of another religion and they just uh, abandon their Christianity. That's being foolish because there is nothing, there is no way else that you can have your sin paid for except by Christ. This is what makes a Christianity unique from all other religions. You can say whatever you want, and I tell you, without the blood of Jesus Christ washing your sins, your sins remain, they remain pegged to you, and they will follow you all the way to hell, and some religion might tell you that you might come back to become a, become a cow or a cat or whatever, or you go to hell to pay, then you can exit. Or you go to purgatory and uh, you get tormented, then you can go to heaven. All those are fables. They are lies. And I'm telling you, 
if you anyone that find themselves in hell it's they're done for they can never come out so now if after hearing me and you go like okay so I need to rededicate myself to the Lord Jesus Christ I need my soul to be forgiven of all the sins that I've committed against God I love God and I want what the Lord Jesus did for me on the cross very simple say Lord Jesus I come to you today I believe that you're the son of God I believe that you died for me on the cross and that you were buried on the third day God the Father raised you from the dead and I ask you today Lord Jesus to please forgive me all my sins I repent of all my iniquity transgressions and sins against you my fellow man and myself forgive me and wash me with your blood and baptize me with the Holy Spirit to teach me your word that I will be grounded in the word of God that's the only truth that there is in this world and I will follow you all my life if you say that the Lord Jesus will hear you if you mean it and he will save you amen